Hey, what's up everybody? This is CLS all in one. In this video, I'll be demonstrating how to roll a joist on a basement addition. There's a lot of advantages to using I joists over traditional solid lumber. The I joists are much lighter and easier to handle and have the ability to span longer distances. And because the I joists are engineered, this eliminates bowing, crowns, and twisting that can take place with the solid lumber. The I joists come in various different sizes from multiple different manufacturers. The ones I'll be working with today are the P3 floor joists manufactured by Ecom Timber Corporation. And these measure at nine and a half inches tall by two and a half inches wide by 16 feet long. And I will be installing these I joists every 16 inches on top of my 16 foot by 24 foot basement addition. I also have a couple rim boards I'll be using for the rim joists. These measure at nine and a half inches high by one and one eighth inch wide by 12 feet long. With most of the I joists that are out there, there is no crown, so the joists can usually mount either direction. To figure out what I joists are suitable for your project, you will want to refer to the manufacturer specifications. The span rating for these P3 I joists is 16 foot 5 inches, but this only applies when the centers are at 16 inches and the subfloor is glued down. Web stiffeners may be necessary to add more structure to the ends of each I joist. To know if web stiffeners are indeed needed, you will need to refer to the manufacturer specs. For my project, I was right at the threshold, so I decided to go ahead and install the web stiffeners. These stiffeners are approximately one inch thick by six and one quarter inch tall and 12 inches long. And I did have to custom rip and cut these from two by eight lumber. The web stiffeners need to be installed with a one eighth of an inch to one quarter of an inch gap towards the top of the webbing when using on an end bearing area. And I did read in the product installation guide that there is some web stiffener material available to purchase but it was not available in my area. So that's why I used some two by eight material to make my own web stiffeners. So it was kind of a pain to do all these custom cuts for the web stiffeners, but after I had them cut, it was really easy to install these. All you gotta do is sandwich these at the end of each I joist, then put two nails on one side, and these are two and a half inch nails. Then after I get the two nails in, I flip it over and put two nails on the other side on the other end of the web stiffeners. And as you can see here, with these being ripped at one inch thick, they are nice and flush with the outside edges of the flanges on the I joist. And because these are flush, they will also fit inside the joist hangers with ease. So one end of this I joist will be mounted flush up against a ledger on the existing home. And the other end will end up being cut one and an eighth of an inch short from the end of the outside wall, because this is where the rim joist will be mounted which happens to be one and one eighth of an inch thick. So ultimately, what you're trying to achieve is getting the rim board flush with the outside wall. And here is a look at the ledger board that has been attached to the face of the house by the use of numerous bolts and construction adhesive along with flush mount eye joist hangers. The ledger board is approximately one and a half inches thick by nine and a half inches tall and spans 24 feet across. And here's a quick look at what I'm trying to achieve with these I joists. Once I have all the joists in place and the subfloor installed, it should end up at the same height as the existing flooring inside my home. And eventually I'll be tearing down the exterior wall, making one big open area. And here's what it looks like after finishing the addition. The red line indicates where the two floors met up. And as you can see, everything is nice and flush with each other. When mounting a ledger board with flush face mount hangers such as these, you'll want to verify the load capacities or shear strength of the bolts, nails, and hangers to ensure everything will be structurally sound. To figure this out, you can refer to the product specs or talk with an engineer to find out what is acceptable. To mount the eye joist hangers, I use this scrap piece of an eye joist to ensure the hanger is correctly positioned on my 16 inch on center marks. Then I secured the hanger with two 10D nails on each side of the hanger. And I'm only using two nails for now because I wanna be able to slide the eye joists in the hangers with ease. Two nails will allow the hangers to have a little give to them. 
and once the eye joists are in position, I will then finish securing the hangers. But with this particular hanger setup, I will be using a mixture of four 10D nails on each side of the hanger and four structural lag bolts on each side of the hanger. These structural lags will provide support for the hanger and also add extra support for the ledger board as well by securing the hangers directly to the existing home rim joist and sill plate. And before you slide the eye joist inside the hangers, it'd probably be a good idea to apply some construction adhesive to the inside of the hangers. This will help eliminate squeaky floors and provide a stronger connection. So at this point, I'm just about ready to start rolling an eye joist into position. And if you don't have much experience cutting an eye joist, it'd probably be a good idea to cut the eye joist first before rolling it in place. To cut an eye joist, you can use a standard skill saw by cutting on both sides of the joist, or you can use a saw saw or even a chainsaw if you're really handy with them. But the cuts need to be nice and square. If a cut is too crooked, the eye joist may become unusable and unacceptable if off more than a quarter inch from being square. Now with all that being said, we do have some experience with cutting an eye joist, so we're going to go ahead and wait to make our cuts until after rolling them into position. Now it's time to start rolling the joist. For this job, one man is on the outside of the foundation, and the other is on scaffolding inside the basement. Since these are fairly lightweight, we can just slide the joist towards the middle of the basement, where I can then grab the joist and guide it inside the hanger. And if the hangers are too tight to just slide it into position, you can use a hammer to tap it in place. Once the joist is in the correct position inside the hanger, I secure the joist with one nail towards the top of the hanger. And this will keep the joist from falling and also allow me to lift the other end to make my cuts, which I will be demonstrating here in just a few. So one end of this eye joist will be resting inside the hanger, and the other end will be resting on top of the sill plate. And eventually I'm going to secure each joist to the sill plate with a couple different nails, but I'm going to wait to do that until after I make my cuts. So I did speed up the footage a little bit during this process, but rolling these out did not take much time at all. We probably had all these joists rolled out inside of 10 minutes. So there's just a few more to go still. And here's a look at all the joists now that they're in place. And I have at least one nail in the top of each hanger to secure that joist inside the hanger. And now it's time to start making some cuts. And as you can see here, a bunch of these have already been cut. So what we're using here is a circular saw. And we're cutting on each side of the joist to make a cut all the way through. So basically what we're doing here is starting a cut from the top of the eye joist. Then we work our way down towards the sill plate. Once the saw reaches the sill plate, we then pull up on the eye joist to finish the cut. Then repeat the same process on the other side of the joist. And again, you want to make sure to cut the ends nice and square. And here's a couple other rules you should follow when making cuts on an eye joist. And you should always refer to the product specifications or the installation guide to make sure what's allowed before you make any special cuts or drill any holes. A couple important rules to follow is to never drill, cut, or notch the flange, and never overcut the webbing. So now that I have all my cuts made, it's time to start securing these to the sill plate. So right here, I'm using two 3 inch nails, and I'm driving these at a slight angle. And you want to make sure to stay at least 2 inches away from the end of the joist, otherwise it may split. And these are spaced every 16 inches with the centers matching the same layout as the joist hangers. With this end eye joist right here, I mounted it flush with the side of the foundation, then secured it with three inch nails approximately every foot on both sides of the bottom flange. And I will also be adding some blocking to the end eye joist. And I'll explain this here in just a few. And now that I have all the eye joists secured to the sill plate, I can finish securing the eye joist hangers. So as I mentioned earlier, I will be securing each hanger with four 10D nails on each side of the hanger, as well as four structural lag bolts on each side of the hanger. And these structural lag bolts were not required to pass load capacities, but they did increase the overall load capacities by a small percentage. So this bolt here will be securing the hanger and the ledger board to the existing home rim joist. 
And I do have a couple different lengths of these structural lag bolts because some will be driven at an angle and some will be driven in straight. After fully securing all the joist hangers, it's time to install the rim joist. So all my joists have been cut one and one eighth of an inch shy from the outside face of the foundation wall, which leaves the perfect gap to install my rim joist board, which is one and one eighth of an inch thick. When mounting the rim joist, I wanted it flush with both edges of the foundation wall. Then I secure it with one nail on the top and bottom of each eye joist. Then also secure it by toe nailing the bottom of the joist every six inches. And here's a closer look at what I'm doing. I'm securing it with one nail at the top of the eye joist, one nail at the bottom. Then I toe nail the bottom of the rim joist into the sill plate. And to secure the rim joist, I am using three inch nails. So I got one nail at the top of the eye joist, one nail at the bottom of the eye joist, then toenail the bottom of the rim joist into the sill plate. They do recommend to make any joints for the rim joist go in between the floor joists. But I found that if you carefully drive the nails equally on both sides of the eye joist flanges, you can make a rim joist joint like this. Now that I have the rim joist secured, it's time to start adding the web stiffeners on the side of the eye joists that were just cut. Since there's no hangers involved on this end, I can just use thicker one and a half inch web stiffeners and just sandwich these on the end of the eye joist, then nail them together. And I can also add a couple nails to the front side of the rim joist that will secure to the web stiffeners that I just installed. And here's a look at it after getting everything secured. And it's just about time to start adding some subfloor. And I did talk about earlier about adding some blocking to the end eye joist. So right here, I will be adding some blocking to give some extra support because this will be a bearing wall. This eye joist is only two and a half inches wide and eventually it will have a two by six exterior frame wall sitting on top of it that will be bearing. And because this wall is slightly wider than the eye joist, extra support is needed. For this setup, I will be adding one foot blocks every 16 inches to add extra support that looks similar to this. And I'll talk more about the blocking here in a few. Now it's time to start installing some subfloor. And the first step will be applying some construction adhesive in the area where the subfloor will be installed. So right here, I'm applying a bead of construction adhesive to the top of the eye joist and the rim joist as well. So for this first piece of subflooring, I'm installing a shorter four foot piece that will line up flush with the edges and centered on the fourth eye joist. Then I nail it down with two and five eighths inch nails with a nail at least every one foot on each eye joist and rim joist edge. And depending on which subfloor you purchase, it may or may not have lines on it already that you can follow for a nail guide. And I would recommend to get three quarter inch tongue and groove subflooring, which will make the subfloor even stronger. Unfortunately, in my area, the tongue and groove flooring was on back order, so I had to just use standard three quarter inch OSB. But I will also be installing some quarter inch underlayment on top of this eventually, which will make the floor plenty strong enough. And while you're installing the subfloor, you may need to adjust each eye joist slightly to keep everything centered perfect with your on center marks. Also, the long side of the subfloor should run perpendicular to the eye joist. And you should also stagger the seams so they don't line up with each other. So with my first row of subfloor, I started with a four foot piece. And on my second row of subfloor, I started with an eight foot piece, which will stagger the seams. Now, before I get all the subfloor in place, I do have a little framing work to do underneath. There will be a staircase dropping down to the basement that will have one landing. So I have to frame a couple walls for the stairs to attach to. And these walls will also support the eye joists because I will be cutting a few of these for the staircase opening. So right here, I'll be making some cuts to each eye joist that's resting on top of the wall. And this was pre-planned. So the eye joists in this area were not nailed to the sill plate or the rim joist, so they can easily be cut and removed when needed. Now that I've made my cuts, I can slide the wall forward, then attach a rim joist board to the front of the eye joist, and that'll end up flush with the front of this wall. And after making sure this wall is plumb and level, I then secure this wall to the floor 
with concrete anchors. And here's a look at the beginning of the staircase opening. And I am using some solid lumber for the staircase headers. So I'm not going to cover the whole building process for this staircase in this video, but I will cover a few more things related to the eye joists. Here's a look from down below after building the landing. And at the opening of the staircase on the side right here, we did add some blocking where the joists were removed. And this will provide the proper support for the bearing wall that will be located up above. Then we also cap this off with a ripped 2x12 to make this have a nicer finish because this will be visible from the inside of the staircase opening. Here is a couple more examples of joist and blocking options. Anytime there is a load bearing wall, you want to make sure it's supported properly. And squash blocks can also be used to transfer the load from above to the bearing below. And here's a look at the staircase after getting the rough finish done. As you can see here, I have quite a bit of solid lumber that I used here to frame the opening and the walls. For the staircase headers, I used a 2x12, then ripped it down to 9.5 inches, so it matched up to the same height as the P3i joist. And the bottom of these walls are anchored in place, and for that bottom plate, I did use some treated lumber where it makes contact with the concrete. And now that I have my staircase all the way framed out, I can continue on with the subflooring. And again, I'm putting a nail at least every one foot on each joist and the rim joist. So at this point, I'm pretty close to being done with the subfloor installation. I just got one more row left. And optionally, you could seal the floor if you want to to protect it from the outside elements until you can get a roof in place. And that's what we did here. We're using some primer sealer to seal the floor. After sealing the floor, we then started the framing process for the exterior walls and interior walls. So this is the first wall we put up, which was 24 feet. Here it is after putting up the side walls. And right here, I'm installing the roof trusses, which is also tying into the existing roof. And here it is after getting the exterior of the house finished. And at this point, we started tearing down the old exterior wall that separated the new addition. Here it is before and after. So this is where the front door used to be located. And here's where the two floors meet up after tearing down the old exterior wall. And here it is after finishing the interior. And here's a before and after picture with the new addition. And I will have a lot of other videos coming out here soon covering a lot of this building process. Okay, it's time for me to go. If you like this video, if you could hit that like button and have yourself a great day and I'll see you next time.